What's going on, world? Welcome to Cork and Curated, our wonderful wine and spirit series. I'm Nova and I will be your spirits guide along this journey. Now, if you happen to take a look at my wonderful ensemble here, what brand would you think that we were gonna get into today? Now, if you thought above Clicquot Rosé, then you would be correct. I wish I had a prize for you, but this is the prize. <laughs> Clicquot is one of the largest champagne houses and they are over 200 years old. They have a variety of different coupes and vintages and it is a world-renowned staple of luxury. You've probably seen the yellow labels, the bottles. I have, I drink it, I know it. The yellow label makes it so easy to recognize. So today we are going to learn about it okay and as in every episode of Quote and Curated we're going to do a little history and then we're going to get to the fun part and do a little tasting okay so let's start with the foundation of the Clico house which was founded in 1772 by Philippe Clicquot Miron. He hails from a family of bakers and textile merchants who also happen to have some vineyards, so they decided to just dabble in the wine industry just a little bit. In 1798, Clicquot arranged for his son Francois to marry Barbe Nicole Ponsardine. So she was the daughter of another uh, well-known textile merchant, and they basically decided to just consolidate their families to game power basically in arranged marriage which was completely common at that time so francois was then made a partner in his father's business and so the name of the company quickly transitioned to clico miron et fils which translates basically to clico miron and son if you speak french you probably know that i know it but now we do okay francois then went on to focus more on the wine and champagne aspect of it because again they were doing textile and banking because he realized that it had some promise to it. With those endeavors, he helped to increase sales, he employed vendors, and he was able to ship all throughout Europe. And while he was in Europe, he met a salesman named Louis Bon. So he would play a very pivotal role in the expansion of the brand. So we gonna remember that name because we're gonna get back to him. But unfortunately, in 1805, just a few years after his marriage, Francois fell ill and he passed away at the age of 30. So after that, his father was then going to liquidate the company. However, his daughter-in-law, Barb, was like, uh-uh, oh no, I don't want to do that. Let me take over, okay? And when she did, she basically became one of the first businesswomen in the 1800s to run an international business in a male-dominated industry. Now, we're just gonna pull it back a little bit and get into some history, okay? Some French history, all the way back into when Napoleon Bonaparte was a uh, ruler of France and he had the Napoleonic Code, which basically said that women were not allowed to work unless they were widowed. So this actually came into her favor. So Barb made a proposal to her father, basically saying, listen, let me take this over since I'm already a widow. He vetted on her, made her go through an apprenticeship to learn the business, and in 1810, they relaunched the brand as Veuve Clicquot Ponsardine. And Veuve literally translates to widow in French, and I was mind blown when I found that out. I had no idea, so I thought that was pretty cool. Back to our history lesson. The French was at war with Russia now, and they had naval embargoes set up, and Russia basically banned all French exports, basically playing with Clicquot's money. So this is where Louis Bon comes back into play, the salesman from Europe. So what he did was was he linked up with Madame Clicquot and helped circumvent the ban by labeling the champagne as coffee. So what they did was they began smuggling the bottles in coffee barrels. So they were ahead of the game. Nothing wrong with a little jug and finesse and they've been doing it since the dawn of time, okay? So once Napoleon was exiled, that's a whole nother history lesson, what they did was they chartered Dutch cargo ships to get even more bottles. So they went from smuggling a little bit to then just getting a lot. Now their other champagne competitors were waiting for things to slow down, but not her. She just jumped right on it, which helped her really to expand the brand and which is why you would also see an anchor on the Clico bottles. So they started expanding in the US, UK, Asia, and then she was then coined Le Grand Dame de la Champagne. And even after her death in July of 1866, her successor who joined the company made sure that the sales kept going. So women do it again, y'all, okay? She just kept it going up. Love it, love to hear it. 1810, she started her first staple vintage, so the harvest was so good that they just kept going with that. And in 1811, their Comet Vintage. Basically, the sales just kept going up because the harvest was so good. 
So shout out to Madame Clico. It's important to note as well that she invented the riddling table in 1816, which helps remove the sediments in the champagne bottles. So champagne is made with yeast. You see how we see the clear champagne bottles now? It wasn't always like that. So imagine seeing like this cloudy substance. Nah, nobody would like that. So basically to remove the sediment, winemakers would usually like transfer the champagne from bottle to bottle. This compromises the quality and all of that. So Madame Clicquot and her cellar master at the time one day was just like, what can we do to make this a little easier? So basically all the riddling table is, is just setting up the bottles at a slant so that the yeast and the sediment, the lees is what it's called, the yeast is called the lees, so that they can basically float up into the neck of the bottle and then be disengorged that way. So it's turned at regular intervals, and that's really it. I mean, it sounds simple enough, but you know, sometimes when people have come in and just, you know, turn the lights on a bit, so. <laughs> so that was just an innovative process that she was also coined with. Another accomplishment for Madame Clicquot was that in 1818, she made the first known blended rosé champagne. So it was a thing, but again, another innovator, okay? So she basically broke away from the traditional uh, way of adding elderberry base to the preparation or a maceration process where they would just basically leave the, the red wine skins in it a little bit to make the rosé, but she wasn't feeling how that tastes, okay? So she said, you know what? I'm literally just gonna add some still red wine into the batch and make it that like, dirt. Like to me, that makes so much sense. You know what I mean? So that was just another accomplishment for her. So just down the line, she just was really doing the thing. So she was just blending it, making it happen. Yeah, if it wasn't for her, the brand wouldn't be what it is today. And then finally, the famous yellow label that we all known to love and recognize was trademarked in 1877. So y'all, I was just so blown away learning everything that I learned about it. I love to geek out and learn about the background of the brand so that, you know, at the parties, I can say, well, <laughs> did you know? You know what I mean? And again, the fact that Vov, and that is how you pronounce it, Vov, like love. Vov Clico means widow. So shout out to this woman and her family for just making it happen and allowing us to continue to enjoy uh, the bubbly, okay? So now we're gonna actually get into the rosé, which is just one of the cuvées. Cuvées just means uh, the different types. So if you look on the Clico website, they have different types, starting with just the yellow brand, the basic one cuvée, and the rosé is a different cuvée, which is why I'm matching it. All right, all my good people in TV and social media land, the moment we've all been waiting for. We're gonna get right into the tasting, okay? And I have our rosé right in the bottle. I have these very cute chalices or whatever you wanna call them that I got from the Polo Classic. I even got a sleeve. Um, this one is actually from the Yellow Label sleeve, but it still serves the same purpose, I guess, to keep it chilled, okay? So without further ado, we're gonna open this baby up. Yum, yum. Okay, look how beautiful and decadent and matchy matchy we are here. Um, and because of my nails, I'm gonna have my crew open it up and they're gonna have some because it ain't no fun unless the homies can't have some. So, thank you. So while you're at home, obviously, um, in the comments, let us know if you've tried the rosé or the other cuvées, things like that. Uh, any commentary, any questions that you have. We wanna know how you feel about the brand. I love the original yellow label, but I also think that the uh, rosé is great. Be careful with that cork, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> oh, that was, that was calm. <laughs> Thank you very much. All right. So even though we have the nice, um, colored chalices, we're gonna just pour into this one for me so that we can look at the properties. Um, again, there's also another way to hold the bottle. You really, but see my nails kind of make the functionality a little, but you're supposed to really put your thumb under here and then tilt it and remember to also always tilt it just so that you can get more of the actual drink and the bubbles are not um, pouring over into the glass. So. I'm just gonna tilt a little bit. I think that's good enough. I'm gonna pour some from my garden. But yeah, this is one thing I really love about the brand. It's so much fun, like all the accessories. And like I said, you could 
you could literally go online and buy these things. Um, I have my eye on the rosé fridge. I'm like, I don't need a rosé fridge, but do I? I'm just gonna let some of these bubbles settle. And if you can already see in this chalice, like the pink color, the bubbles, smelling really delicious. Can't wait for you to go. All right. So first we're just gonna look at the properties a little bit. You know, obviously we see the bubbles, we see the pink color here. We're gonna smell, and taste is subjective, smell is subjective. Um, if you look on the, the properties, it'll say berries, things like that, but if you've never had a certain berry, how are you gonna know like what that even tastes like? So it's really up to you to discern what you like from it. Um, this is a Brut Rosé, so it is a little on the drier side, which I like. I'm not really a fan of really sweet wines and things like that, but again, it's all up to you. It's about having fun, enjoying, and now that we've done our research, let's get into the tasting. So. Cheers to you and cheers to my team. Love. And remember when you're drinking a champagne, you wanna hold on to the stem. The only time you really wanna hold it like this is maybe if it's a red wine, but you don't want your hands to heat up um, the beverage, so. I'm trying to see what fruits I smell. Like I'm really trying to get into my sommelier bag here and see what it is that I'm smelling, but I don't really know what I'm smelling, y'all. <laughs> Guys, how do you feel? What do you what do you feel about the taste of it? You feeling it? Yeah. Yeah, hold it on the stem. I mean, unless it's a red, but you don't want, like if you're holding it like this, then it's gonna warm it up and that's what we don't want, so. Yeah, but I love it. It's not really a bad aftertaste to it. Um, it goes down smooth, subtle hints of fruit that I do taste, but yeah, this is what I really enjoy about it because it's not too sweet. It's not like a Moscato or anything like that. No disrespect to anybody that likes Moscato, but what happens is as you learn and you taste different beverages, you, you acquire a taste to, to what it is that you like. And I just prefer it a little bit on the drier side. But yeah, we love Clico. It's so good. A lot of like the luxury brands, sometimes I feel don't live up to the hype, but Clico is one of them that I really do enjoy. I love to have a bottle of not even just the rosé, but the, the yellow label in my fridge. So. Um, yeah, if you haven't tried it, I implore you all to. In the comments, let us know how you feel about it. Tell us which one is your favorite. If you love the rosé, what you love about it. If you love the other cuvées or which other cuvées you might want us to try. And this also is a fancy schmancy uh, wine bottle stopper. And this is to keep the air inside. So it's basically like an airtight. So you're just gonna stick that down in there and then clasp it on and this will uh, give the shelf life up to maybe like three days. So, yeah. And you can get this at like Amazon or honestly a regular liquor store. But y'all, thank you so much for tuning in uh, to Corgan Curated. I hope you had as much fun as I did learning about Buff Clico. And yeah, make sure you hit that like, follow, subscribe button. And again, show us some love in the comments. And let us know how you feel. Remember to drink responsibly. Tune in next time.